I know as Ben comes up, he needs no introduction. If you have been around CPC for a while, Ben came to faith here at the church and for the past 14 years has been pouring his life back into this church in a myriad of ways. Uh, when Ben asked Pastor Tim, is there any chance I could uh, give a sermon at church as part of his ongoing training, I said, absolutely, when can we make this happen? Uh, I know you won't be surprised uh, to hear his giftedness. We have so many people in our church who are gifted, and Ben is one of them, and the Lord has put a word on his heart. Ben, we're honored to have you here and preaching and sharing God's word with us, and blessings to you Thank as you. you bring God's word. Let's welcome Ben as he brings God's word. Well, good morning. Wow, this is interesting to be up on this side. I'm usually in the corner over there behind the, behind the uh, computer, so it's interesting to be on this side of the camera this time. Uh, but thank you so much for letting me uh, preach God's Word this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little later. Um, but yeah, my name is Ben. I grew up in this church. Uh, this was home for me. Middle school was my first opportunity to come and, and truly hear the gospel for the first time, and I will mention that a little later. Uh, but I want to warn you, as we're going to go into the sermon this morning, uh, up to this point, we've been in fellowship, we've sung songs, we've prayed, we've heard God's word, and I feel like we're on this kind of mountaintop, and now I'm going to take you into a valley. And I want to be assured that on the other side of this valley is truly a glorious mountaintop. Uh, we're going to be reading from Psalm 88, and uh, it has to do, this, the theme for this morning is how Christians are supposed to uh, deal with dark times. And so my final warning before we dig in is that the first of the four points that I'm going to say is a real downer. First is a real downer, but there really is, as we go into the valley, there really is a mountaintop on the other side, something truly wonderful. So if you have a Bible, please open up to Psalm 88. Um, I will be reading it as well. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 and then 6 to the end. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord, I spread my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up and praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abanan? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors, I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me, your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in me on altogether. You caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. So now the Bible, and specifically the book of Psalms, is filled with prayers by suffering people all throughout, from Genesis to Revelation. There are prayers by people going through times of darkness, and, and, but virtually all of them, especially the Psalms, virtually all of them end in some note of hope, right? There's something at the end that you say, I, I, I see you here finally, or, or I, I know I'm going to see you, I know I'm one day going to understand. There's some note of hope at the end, but there are two Psalms in the Psalter, which is term for the collection of psalms. There's two psalms in the Psalter that don't end like that. This is one of them. The other one is Psalm 39. And in fact, you'll notice there's one word that kind of sticks out throughout the reading of it, and it's the word darkness. And it shows up three times, and it's clearly the theme of the psalm. And actually, in the ESV translation, which I think does a pretty good job most of the time, uh, the last line is, my companion has become darkness. And Probably a more contemporary way, English way, to uh, understand that last line is that darkness is my closest friend. And maybe an even more literal translation of that, if you look at the actual Hebrew, the way it was written, it's only one word as the last sentence of the psalm, and it's just the single word darkness. So that's how the psalm ends. 
So in other words, the very, 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 very end of the psalm ends with my only friend, my closest friend, darkness. And that's the end of the prayer. So now what kind of prayer ends like that? What kind of prayer ends not in hope? What prayer is this doing in the Bible? And so that's the question I want to look at this morning is what is this prayer doing in God's word? Well, I think it's here for a number of reasons, but specifically I think there's four things that I have uh, identified. And the first is that this psalm is going to teach us that darkness can be something that lasts a long time for a believing Christian. A believing Christian can be in a dark place for a good while. Secondly, however, it will teach us that there's no better place to learn about the grace of God than in dark times. Thirdly, there's no better place to become a person of greatness than in dark times. And lastly, and this is kind of an interesting one that I want to end on, darkness can be relativized. So let's look at these four things. First, we learn that darkness is something that for a believing Christian can last a good while. And this man in the very beginning of the psalm Uh, He says, you are the God who saves me. So he's actually trusting God as Savior. That's clear. That's evident from line one. And he's praying from the bottom of his heart. I mean, this this is a raw prayer. You read this and you can't help but have your heart sink a bit for the man who's praying this. Very, very raw. So there's, I think there's two kinds of darkness that we identify in our lives. There's outer darkness, which has more to do with like the circumstances of your life that's happening Uh, We really don't know what's happening with this man. We do know that he's losing all of his friends. We also know that he seems to be facing death. And it's either imminent or at least it's possible uh, because of the questions that he says in in the psalm. He says, do the dead rise up and praise you? Is your righteousness known in the land of oblivion? So he's clearly facing death of some sort. So outwardly, the circumstances of his life include darkness, but inwardly, he's experiencing darkness as well. And I think from, from human experience, right, if, if, if outwardly things are, are going wrong, but inwardly you feel God's peace, you feel God's presence, you can make it. But that's not what's happening here. He feels that he's been abandoned. He feels that God is angry with him. He feels that God has rejected him. He feels that God is gone. So he's experiencing both outward darkness and inward darkness. And he's praying and he's trusting God as Savior, but by the end of the prayer, he's still in darkness. So what's the teaching here then? Well, I think the teaching is that you can be a believing Christian, you can be trusting in God for your salvation, you can be praying and you can be doing all the things that you are supposed to be doing, and yet it doesn't seem like things get better for a long time. Now, you might say, well, you warned me that the first point's a downer, Um, and it is. But on the other hand, it's a mercy as well. So why is it a mercy? Well, first of all, it teaches us something. It teaches us about the realism of the Bible. So let me quote from uh, one of, I think, one of the greatest works of art in all of human history, one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride. And um, there's a famous line uh, in the movie, and... He says, life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Well, guess what? The Bible's not selling anything. If you think, uh, if you're thinking about becoming a Christian, if you're interested in Christianity, if you're coming here and you've never heard the gospel, if you've never really don't know much about the Christian faith, I want you to know that Christianity is realistic. It's not selling you anything. It tells you that you can do everything right, And you can still have pretty long times in which the darkness just doesn't seem to lift. But there is a mercy, and I'll get to it in a second. But first, I want to to note that it does start with our expectations. So over the years, as I've kind of grown up in the church and I've been involved in more and more ministries, uh, I've heard people actually say this, and I've heard uh, versions of this. People say, you know, when I became a Christian, uh, I figured out that I'm a Christian, and I'm walking with God, nothing really bad can happen to me. I'm a Christian, I'm a good person now, I've cleaned up my life, Uh, really bad things can't happen to me. Well, okay, I know someone better than you, way better than you, 
Jesus Christ, and he did not have a great life. He was rejected, he was tortured, and he was killed. And he actually says, by the way, Jesus says in John chapter 16, in this world you will have trouble. It's a promise. You will have trouble. And he even says, he goes further than that, he says, a servant is not above his master. The world hated me, it's going to also hate you. And here's the mercy. Expectations are a big part of how you handle, how you and I both handle suffering. Suffering is painful, suffering is terrible, but what if on top of that, and this is your fault, my fault too, the suffering may not be your fault, but false expectations, the idea that, well, now that I'm a Christian, bad things can't happen to me, my life is good, you know, nothing's going to touch me, they happen to Jesus. They're going to happen to you too. And also, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus says. And so if your expectations, if they're aligned with reality, if they're aligned that the Bible is not selling you anything, if they align with the reality of Scripture, it can enormously help you face the troubles. Because oftentimes, half of the pain that you're feeling is not from the suffering, it's from the false expectations. How could this be happening to me? It shouldn't happen to me. Why, why, why? Well, a servant is not above his or her master. It happened to our master. So you should be glad. That's the worst of the four points. <laughs> but my encouragement to you is to adjust your thinking. Adjust your thinking. The Bible is not selling you anything. There is a realism about Christianity, and therefore you can stay in darkness for a very long time and be a Christian and pray to God. Those three things can happen together. So second point, the dark times are really the best place to learn about the grace of God. And so, see, I've given the man credit so far, but let's take a, let's take a look at the ways in which uh, he's not doing things all that well in this prayer. So for example, some of this prayer is not really a prayer at all. It's actually an interrogation, really. And so for example, when he says, do you show your wonders to the dead, or do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave? Those are sarcastic rhetorical questions. The man knows the answer to, what the, to those questions. He even goes on, is your faithfulness known in the land of destruction? Here's what he's saying. I want to be your witness, God. I want to tell the world about you. But how am I going to do that if I'm dead? I have all of these things that I want to do for you. You know that. And you're not letting me do any of them. So how does that make any sense? And he gets very, very, very close to saying, answer me, God. So some people would read this and they would go, okay, well, that's teetering on rude. Others would call it downright blasphemous. And it's probably somewhere in the middle. But nonetheless, he's not controlling his heart. He's not being deferential. He's not being respectful. He's not saying, as we sung in the uh, as we sung in the, in the songs, as we prayed in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. He's not saying any of that. And by the way, a lot of commentators point something out you might miss. I certainly did. But there's, a, there's another place in the psalm, in this exact psalm, where he says, from my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. From my youth I have suffered your terrors and I'm in despair. And we're going to see in a minute because the heading of the psalm, which I skipped, actually tells us who wrote this. Um, this is almost certainly an exaggeration. What he's actually saying is, all of my life I've been in danger. All of my life I've been close to death. You've been abandoning me. You've never been there. That's what he's really saying. And it's almost certainly an exaggeration. And there's a tendency for us to do the same thing. Right? We look at life through the one little lens that, of, of what we're going through in the moment. And that's exactly what the man's doing here. Instead of, in maturity, knowing God's work, standing back and saying, God, you have done so many good things in my life. And some of the Psalms do do that. This guy is not doing that. This prayer is not doing that. He's saying, you have never been there for me, ever. He's exaggerating. He's cross-examining God. He's being incredibly disrespectful, if not blasphemous. And of course, the last statement, darkness is my closest friend, that's quite a charge. That's quite a statement. And here's what he's saying to God. God, darkness is being a better friend than you are right now. 
I would rather have darkness than you right now. Even darkness is more of a comfort than you are being. So he's not doing things well, and you have to ask yourself again, why in the world is this prayer in the Bible? Why in the world? And this prayer and also Psalm 39, which I mentioned earlier, are very, very similar. And so Psalm 39 ends with a psalmist saying, turn your face away from me, God, so I can get a little bit of peace before I die. That's how Psalm 39 ends. And to be perfectly honest with you, I never knew what to do with these prayers. I never knew how to, aside from identifying with them sometimes, I never knew what to do with them. And I just kind of skipped over them quickly or went to the Psalms that made me feel good, right? You, or that end on this kind of note of hope, let alone I never thought I'd be preaching on one of them. And a few months ago in one of my classes in seminary, I read two sentences from a little commentary by a man named Derek Kidner. And he was talking about these prayers and he said something, I'm sure you guys have had this, two lines that just hit you like a freight train. And it completely changed the way that I looked at not just these prayers, but just darkness in general. And he says this, quote, The very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they're desperate. And now you do realize what this means. What Kidner is saying is the very fact that God put these in the Psalter, they're there because God put them there. He wanted them in the Bible. And what does that tell us about God? Well, it tells us quite a lot. You see, if you... If you don't have God looking at this prayer, like he's not going into Scripture saying, oh my gosh, what is that doing in Scripture? Uh, I don't want that in my Bible. I don't, I don't want people thinking that it's okay to pray to me like this. I don't want people to think I'm the God of that kind of guy. But God's, God did put it in the Bible, and he wants it in the Bible. And he's identifying with those of us who sometimes pray like this. And you know Why? Because fundamentally, he's a God of grace. He's understanding, and he knows how we speak when we're desperate. God is saying, I am the God of this man, not because he's getting it right, but because I'm a God of grace. And he's, here's what he's saying to you, here's what he's saying to me when we read this psalm. I am your God, not because you put on a happy face in the morning, not because you do everything, not because you have a nice suit, not because you come and do everything and say everything you're supposed to do. I am your God because I'm a God of grace. Do you know how liberating that is? How should it should be liberating? What an amazing truth about God's character. And I can tell you this, let me just say, I have learned 10 times more about the grace of God in times of darkness than I have in times of prosperity. Doesn't mean I like going through the darkness, but I sure as heck learn a lot more about God's character. So third point, number three, not only are dark times the best places to learn about the grace of God, but they're also the best times, the best places to become a person of greatness. And let me tell you what I mean by that. It's true that this guy is not doing everything right. He's saying a lot of things he shouldn't be saying. He's insulting God. He's saying things he shouldn't be saying, but he's saying them to God. And that reminds me, and should remind you, if you've read uh, the book of Job, about Job's life. And if you're unfamiliar, let me just give you a quick little summary. So the book of Job starts with Satan coming into the presence of God, and God says to Satan, look at my servant Job, there is none like him in all the earth. And Satan says to God something very, very interesting. He says, does, God, does Job serve God for naught? Does Job serve God for nothing? And so what Satan is doing is he's questioning the idea that Job really doesn't truly love or actually serve God for God. So basically, here's what he's saying. Job is in a transactional relationship with you, God. Job is doing X, Y, Z because you do X, Y, Z. Job is loving you and Job is following you and he's being obedient. He's doing sacrifices, going here, there, and everywhere because you bless him, because you give him stuff, because you make his life good. He's actually loving himself and he's just using you. He's doing things only because you're benefiting him. So take those things away, give him outer darkness and inner darkness, and you'll see that he'll curse you. Now, that's also quite a charge. And especially when that has probably happened to every single one of us in this room at one point or another. 
Have you ever thought that someone actually liked you for you? And then you figured out at one point that they were just trying to get something out of you or have a door opened or get a job opportunity or something financial, something you had, whatever. It's a horrible feeling to be used. Well, okay, how do you think God feels? And how much more inappropriate is it for us to treat him that way? So what Satan is doing, what Satan is actually bringing up is a very important point. And of course, don't forget that the book of Job was written for us as well. So don't go thinking that this is only applies to Job himself. This applies to us. So what the author of Job wants us to see is that Satan is asking the exact same thing about us. Satan is saying, do we really serve God or not? Do we serve God for nothing? Do we really love God for himself, or do we love ourselves and we're using God for what he can offer? Okay, so, class, is Satan right about you? Is Satan right about me? And I think the honest answer, I think the answer to some degree is yeah, he is. At least to start out that way, I mean, let's be honest about it, we all come to God at one point or another in the beginning, we all, uh, and by the way, that doesn't mean you don't really trust God as Savior, that doesn't really mean that you have not made a pledge to follow him and, and surrender your life to him, but to a, to a great degree in the beginning, we all come because we want something. We all come because we need something. There's an emptiness, there's a void in our lives. But if we stay that way, if we stay in that state, there is a self-centeredness at the center of that Christianity that is just not good. It's not of God. And it's really the reason all the, like, why we're getting knocked around all the time, spiritually, emotionally, that's the reason. Depending on how things are going up and down, ping-ponging back and forth emotionally. Why is God doing this to me? We really get cast down, and it gets us down. And one of my Old Testament professors tried to help uh, the class understand the book of Job. And he says, do you notice how like, Job prays all these terrible things? Like Most of Job's prayers are like this. They're very, very, very negative. And he's always saying terrible things. At the very end of the book of Job, God says something remarkable about Job. He says, Job has honored me. He actually turns to Job's friends and he says, you better ask Job to pray for you or I'm going to smite you. That's a whole other story about Job's friends. Job has honored me and you have not. That's God's comments. And so the Old Testament professor said, he said, why in the world, after all of those terrible prayers, would God say that Job honored him? You see, Job, the, the professor said, the answer is because they're prayers. Job was angry, he was complaining, he was angry, he was complaining, but he was being angry and he was complaining to God. He never walked away. He said, I don't understand you, I'm angry, but he never walked away. He stayed with God when he was seemingly getting nothing out of it, which means in the end Satan was defeated and Satan was wrong about Job. And here's what's happening here is this man, even though he is not in any way praying the way he ought to be praying, he's still praying. He says, darkness is my closest friend, but he's saying it to God, which means Satan is defeated, which means when you go through darkness, if you don't feel like God's there, but you hold on anyway, and you say, you know what, you're God and I'm not, I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of this, but I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to go to church. I'm still going to worship. I'm still going to love my neighbor. I'm still going to be in fellowship with other believing Christians. I'm still going to do the things that Scripture tells me to do. That obedience will turn you into a person not self-centered, not in a transactional relationship, up and down all the time, getting ping-ponged around. It'll turn you into a person of endurance. It'll turn you into a person of stability, of strength, of greatness. So it's in the darkness where you throw away that transactional approach. It's almost like when bad things happen, God kind of is like, all right, now we're going to see why you really got into the Christian faith. Now we're really going to see if you love yourself or if you love me, if you're serving yourself or if you're serving me. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, when you say, okay, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to serve you. 
It's going to change you. It's going to make you an unflappable person. So fourth point, this is the last point. And actually, up to, the, up to now, I've not addressed the main question. Um, the psalmist believes his darkness was objective. He believed his darkness was permanent. He says so. He's, he's not just saying, I feel like you have abandoned me. He's saying, you're not there. He doesn't say that it's temporary. He says it's permanent. So in other words, this man believed that his darkness was absolute. It wasn't temporary. It wasn't subjective. It was absolute. So we actually do know that he's wrong. We know that his suffering was actually relative, it was temporary, and that God was there for him. Well, how do we know that? Well, because the psalmist, the man who wrote this psalm, you can see at the very heading of the psalm, was a man named Heman, and that's not to be confused with Haman, who's the villain of the book of Esther, um, but Heman. And what we know about Heman is this, in 1 Chronicles 6, Heman was the leader of the Kohathites Guild of Musicians and Poets a guild in which wrote many of the psalms. And if you want to go see some of them, they're in the 40s and then the 80s in the psalms. That's, their, that's their, uh, their body of work. And now keep in mind, the book of psalms is one of the greatest works of literary art in all the world. And if, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you, you get that. And anyone can open up the psalms and be absolutely mesmerized by what's in the book. So what this means is that this man, Heman, wrote some of the greatest art in the history of the world. It means that millions of people have been helped by him. It means that, well, you know how a uh, piece of coal by pressure is turned into a beautiful diamond? The suffering was not absolute. It was temporary. It was relative. And God uh, was there through this suffering. This man was being turned into a great artist through his suffering. Somebody who, and by the way, do you think that Heman, when he was going through the suffering, thought that 2,500 years later in the middle of Carmel by the Sea, hundreds of people would be talking about this work of art? No, of course not. There's no way he could have thought that. There's no way he could have saw it. But you know what? We can. We can see it. We can see that God was there, that God was working, and it was temporary. God was turning him into something wonderful and great that he would use for centuries in the future. And you can know that too. If God is your Savior and you're relying on him, he is there. Even if you don't feel it, even if you feel abandoned and you are in darkness, he has not abandoned you. He is working. You say, well, how do I know that? How do I know that? Well, here's how you can know that. You ready to get your minds blown a little bit? Are you ready just to see how consistent the Bible is with itself? Remember, the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Now I'm going to go to the New Testament. Remember the end of Psalm 39 that I've said, God, turn your face away from me. End of Psalm 88, darkness. God's face, losing God's face. Does that sound familiar to you? Matthew 27, 45, this is the narrative of Jesus' crucifixion. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came down over all the land. At the ninth hour, Jesus on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why have you turned your face from me? Nope. Why have you forsaken me? And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Heman thought that he was getting absolute total darkness. He thought he was totally abandoned by God. Nope. Jesus got the total darkness that Heman thought he was getting. When Jesus went to the cross, he was abandoned. His disciples had left him. His people had left him. His father had abandoned him. Darkness was his only friend. And you know why he took the sins upon himself that we've committed? We say that all the time in church. God took our sins, God took our sins. Do you know why he took our sins? By the way, Satan's right about us. We do exploit others. We, we are self-centered. We do use other people. We deserve to have God turn his face away from us. We deserve that darkness that Jesus got. But in his infinite mercy and in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite grace, 
Jesus took the darkness so that when you and I believe in him, your sins are forgiven. Or put it another way, Jesus Christ experienced darkness as his only friend so that when you are in your darkness, you can know that Jesus is still your friend. He's still there. He's still your Lord. He's got you. Jesus was truly abandoned so that you will only ever feel abandoned. And you can know that God is still there, and you, no matter what's going on, no matter what you've done wrong, Christ has got you. He's taken the penalty. It all fell on him. And remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the most raw moments of Jesus' life, pain, darkness crushing down on him as he's considering the cross. He stayed with us. He did not abandon us in his darkness, so why in the world do you think that he would abandon you in yours? He won't do it. So listen, you remember that sarcastic question that human asks in the psalm, that sarcastic question that he says, do the dead rise up and praise you? Well, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the answer is yes. You will rise one day. Hold on to that truth. So there was a woman uh, at the church that I went to in L.A. when I was in college. She had terminally ill cancer. I didn't really know her all that well, but it's kind of one of those faces you see at church every Sunday. And I remember asking her, um, you know, how are you doing? How's your treatment going? Are you in pain? Are you in discomfort? How can I be praying for you? And she would always say, this lovely lady, she said every single time, some version of this, of this, nothing that the resurrection won't cure. Hold on to that. Cling to that. Michael Wilcock is another guy who wrote a really great little commentary. I'm going to end with this. On this psalm specifically, 88, and he says this. This darkness can happen to a believer. It doesn't mean you're lost. This darkness can happen to someone who does not deserve it at all. After all, it happened to Jesus. That doesn't mean you've strayed. This darkness can happen at any time as long as this world lasts, but only in the next world will such things be done away with. This darkness can happen without you knowing why, but there are answers. There is a purpose, and eventually you will know it. So to actually close, um, I, I had this Irish professor who was uh, essentially teaching uh, preaching principles, and one of his big things, he said, when you're preaching, um, imagine this crusty old jaded guy to the church sitting in the back pew and your goal should be, why does this matter to him? Now, if you're a Christian and you, and you go to church, you get this stuff, right? This is music to your ears. But if you're jaded, if you're in darkness, that's who I'm preaching to. And so here's why this matters. So I said earlier on what an honor it is to be uh, here preaching for my first time um, at the church where... See, 15 years ago, I heard the gospel for the first time. 12 years ago, I accepted Christ and surrendered to him for the first time. And I was a kid, a teenager at the time, um, struggling with identity issues, with self-worth issues, with regret, um, as deep as the ocean, Right over in that, in that room over there. And I heard the gospel multiple times, faithfully preached, and eventually I cried out to God, and he heard me, and he plucked me from those waters. And now I'm his, I'm sorry. So, many of you have been uh, following me in this church for a long time. You've seen me grow up. And I mean no disrespect to the 11 o'clock service, I'm keeping this between us. Um, <laughs> it's not lost on me that the 9.30 service has a lot to do with the finances of this church. And what I mean by that is that you have been faithful and you've been obedient in giving. And let me be absolutely clear, God is the one that saved me, but he gave me a community and a church that is obedient, not just financially, but with their time, with their wisdom, with their prayers, and I went from a kid in a valley, lost, to being able to stand up here this morning and preaching about the good news of the gospel. 
So that's why this matters. That's why you are to cry out to God. That's why you're to be obedient in times of darkness. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for having the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you for yourself. I thank you for your character. I thank you that you are fundamentally a God of grace. That no matter the circumstances of one's life, before they know you, lost in total, utter darkness, that you are a God who will pluck them and you will deliver them to safety in your arms. And God, that is our goal as the church, is to be aiming at those people. But God, as the church, sometimes we need encouragement, we need wisdom, we need direction. So God, I thank you for people like Heman. I thank you for people in scripture that we can look to that are relatable, that are, that are fallible, that mess up. But we can look at your story of, of, of grace, of sticking with the people that you have chosen to be your adopted children. You never fail them. So God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people in this building. God, I pray for their obedience. I know there's a lot of pain and darkness right now. I know there's things that people just seem like it's not going to end. But God, you say something different. You say that it one day will. One day we will see you face to face. And that is our hope. That is our trust. So God, I thank you and I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.